Uh, when I listened to Jed, I became thankful that I'm not a member of the Yale Law School faculty. Um, <laughs> Um, let me just sort of start with one point about the analysis and then try to go on to what I think is the topic, i.e. redistribution, which is the same year that Coppage in Kansas came down, which is Andy Stern's favorite case, because what it held was that collective bargaining agreements forced upon employers was an unconstitutional taking of property. Uh, the Supreme Court decided a case called Brush Harbor, which essentially validated the progressive taxation. So uh, the basic theory that the old court had was not one that was crudely anti-redistributivist, for better or for worse. It was one that thought that redistributions should take place through the tax system rather than by the alteration of the rules of property, contract, and tort. And the way in which they viewed the court was quite different from Jed Rubenfeld. They thought these rights came from below in Lockean fashion, and the state would then have some power to protect them rather than from coming above, because if they come from above, redistribution is, in fact, only an artifact of state power. But the reason why the problem is so difficult is that people actually don't believe that. I mean, to some extent, we're all Lockeans, and we think that first possession is the way in which you acquire external things and that you don't have to do anything particular in order to acquire the right to use your own labor. And so then the question is, given this particular theory, why is it that people think that redistribution is, A, an interesting topic and a hard topic? And the way I think you set up the discussion is to say, far from the fact that we don't know what the term means, is that we all know in moral terms exactly why it is that there is a case for redistribution. And then the issue is whether or not the moral case can survive the practical difficulties that stand in the path of its implementation. And what's the moral case? Essentially, we assume that people acquire property um, through either occupation or through purchase. Uh, the differentials that were referred to by Justice Pitney in the Coppage in Kansas cases are properly observed. It's the direct correlate in an early anticipation of Nozick's theory, for example, only better stated, I dare say. Um, so you have all of that going on. And then what you do is you look around and you ask, is there a way in which we could make a social improvement on this if it turns out that some people are way down at the bottom and others are way up at the top? Uh, the modernists, I think, underestimate the force of the case for redistribution by treating it simply as a technical logarithmic function in wealth. Uh, the poor folk, old times back, said, no, redistribution is really important because if I have a lot and you have a very little, very little may be below subsistence and you can starve, and we can see a very powerful kind of social improvement that takes place if we transfer some wealth from those who have it and can live, give it to somebody else who will draw, die, and the hope is that through that kind of improvement, we could make the world a better off and a more powerful place. And I have never seen anybody come forward and say, you know, this whole idea of redistributing of wealth is just so terrible that we ought to ban it from our moral and from our political discourse. I have heard on occasions people make the economic argument that there are no interpersonal comparisons of utility, you can't figure out what's going on, and so therefore you can never be sure when you have a coerced transfer of wealth from one party to another that you've made some kind of a social improvement. But that argument, to my mind, actually proves too much because if you go around and you look at the regularities in human behavior, what you discover consistently and persistently is that the height of laissez-faire, you also had an extremely strong tradition of voluntary redistribution from those who had wealth to those who needed it. And this was not regarded, generally speaking, as simply a kind of naked preference of the sort, like I prefer strawberry to pistachio ice cream. It was regarded as a moral obligation or an imperfect legal obligation enforced by social sanction and, support by con con and supported by con conscience. So it wasn't thought to be one of these simple operational optional things. And I think the reason why the redistribution question turns out to be as difficult as it is, is if people accept this particular framework, they're then going to ask the question, if we can do this voluntarily and we understand why it's going to be done, ought we to do it politically to the event that we think that the amount of voluntary transfers are going to be insufficient in order to carry the day and get us to the point where we would like to be? So the next question that you have to ask is can we take a moral intuition and transfer it into a set of legal obligations? And this, I think, is where the problems start to begin. But I'm going to treat them as problems rather than as knockout blows. I want to express what the difficulties are and how I think you ought to organize this. And so I will come up with what I regard as a far-sighted and progressive program, which I sometimes put under the label of redistribution last. <laughs> 
And what I mean by that is that your first task in trying to create a social order is to handle the problem of poverty through production and the increase in wealth. Once you do that, there may well be those who are laggards, but if you can increase the size of the pie, you can increase the probabilities that voluntary contributions will solve the issue, or if they will not, if you can increase the size of the pie, you'll put less strain on the system when it comes to the question of how you do redistribution. So what are the problems with respect to redistribution, which means that you can't take it off the table, but sort of have to put it at the back of the table? I think the first one that you always have to ask is what's the optimal level of redistribution that you want to deal with, and what's the metric that you're going to use to solve it? When people are in favor of a progressive taxation, there's always one lacunae in the argument that needs to be filled. How steep ought the progressivity to be? I'm a great defender of the tax, flat tax, but I won't even talk about that here because I <laughs> got a little <laughs> Steve to do this. But if you're trying to think about progressivity, if it's a slight progression, it doesn't get you much. If it's a steep progression, it may result in real administrative difficulties on the one hand and a general dulling of incentives on the other. To put the thing even further, the moment you let the tilt of the statute go into play, there are going to be vast political forces trying to either increase it or reduce it, and you run the danger that the dissipation of wealth in order to create the tax structure that you like will, in fact, negate most of the gains that you help to produce from it. And you also have, of course, the incentive effects that take place if redistribution does take place there'll be less incentive to produce by those who are going to be forced to make the redistribution and less incentives to produce by those who are going to get it, each side preferring to devote its resources to conflicts between the party instead of trying to move things up. These are on balance things that we would rather avoid and the general view that I have is there's a certain level at which there's a strong social consensus that supports the modest redistribution. Once you go beyond that, it's going to become much more difficult to figure out the way in which you want to operate the overall system. And then the second thing you have to worry about, this is the technical matter, is exactly how you measure the base for which the redistribution is going to take place. Um, one of the common statements, for example, by the president is that people are defined as rich if they earn $250,000 a year. Well, that may be rich in Manhattan, Kansas, as I like to say. It doesn't get you very far if you're in New York City. Uh, in addition to that, when you start looking at wealth, it's a very bad measure of what it is that somebody has, I mean income, because of all the difficulties with the permanent income hypothesis. So there are many young doctors and lawyers and professionals who earn a quarter of a million dollars but have twice that amount in accumulated debts because what they did is they deferred their income earlier on and are going to pay it back with their future earnings. If you start using redistribution off of snapshots, you miss all of those kinds of variances, and that's going to mean that the tax is going to hit those people who ought not to take place. Trying to run income averaging against this stuff is not going to deal with the problem of indebtedness. You've got a lot of technical issues on this thing, which should, I think, slow you down. Now, the second point that I'd want to make about this kind of takes the thing one step further, which is how do you know you're going to do the only kind of redistribution which makes sense, which is to take advantage of diminishing marginal utility of wealth and to create a system in which you transfer from those who have to those who have not. And what I'm referring to here more generically is the entire system of public choice difficulties where, in fact, redistribution often goes in the wrong direction for the wrong reasons through the wrong time of programs. One of the reasons why I've been such a strong defender of Coppage in Kansas and, in fact, of the classical liberal torts is that I think whenever you look at a whole variety of social programs which are ostensibly adopted for other reasons, it turns out that many of them have very profound and very bad kind of redistributivist tendencies that one ought to be able to deal with. So, for example, whenever you start dealing with a monopoly type situation, from a competitive industry, there is a huge transfer of wealth which takes place from the consumers and goes to the producers. There is a reduction in consumer surplus, and there is an overall reduction in social losses by the creation of dead weight loss. This is the standard diagram of monopoly in their Economics 101 course, and the things about it that is true is it's one simple and two correct. So you start looking at programs which are engaged in redistribution, oftentimes they are A, wealth destructive, and B, they're transferring the wealth to the wrong people. 